Genesis 22 and 1, a familiar story. If you've been saved any length of time, you could preach this, but you don't get two, I get two, because the Lord laid it on my heart this morning. Everybody ready? The Bible says, and it came to pass after these things. How many of y'all know that there's always things? It sure is. That after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. When God calls your name, you need to say, present and accounted for. Here I am. Pick me. God asked, God asked Isaiah, he, he, he said, whom shall we send? And Isaiah said, pick me, pick me, pick me. I want to I do it. Amen. We ought to be that way, oughtn't we? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, you are great and you are mighty and worthy of all praise the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. Oh, God, receive our praise this day, and Lord, come. Come, Lord, and let us feel your very real presence. And God, quicken this word. Let it be more than printed page. God, leap it off the page. Leap it off the wall, Lord, and into our hearts. And let us see what the Spirit would say to the bride of Christ this day. And Lord, if there's some that's backslid, God, get us back right with you this morning at an altar of repentance and recommitment. If there's some that's not saved, God, save them today. Lord, hell is sure, but Lord, forgiveness is sure also if we'll just ask for it. So God, save the lost today. And God, encourage those that are down and God, we love you and praise you and hear our prayers of repentance and recommitment this very day. And everybody said, Amen. you get to sit down and take the rest of the morning off. I'll call you in a minute, Brother Nard. That didn't mean you. <laughs> it came to pass after these things that God did tempt. How many of y'all know I'm a King James Version kind of guy? If you've heard any, any of my sermons before, you know I love the King James here is a place where I don't love the King James. Why do I love, Brother, Brother Joe's preaching this thing ahead of me. I can't get, he, he, <laughs> I appreciate students of the word and those that retain the word. Brother Joe's always giving me good nuggets up here. You may not get to hear them, but I get to hear them. What's the problem with Genesis 22 and 1? I'm going to turn this morning for this one verse into interactive service, raise your hand, don't have to get a blurt alert. What is wrong with verse 1? Brother Joe, tempt. God don't tempt anybody is what Brother Joe said. He is paraphrasing James 1 and 13, brother man. Here's what it says. It says, let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So what do we have? Put that thing in reverse and go back to Genesis 22 and 1. What do we see? It says that God did tempt. So what is that? That is a poor choice of, tra of possible translations. When you look that up in your blue letter Bible, your so Bible study software, whatever it is, when you find the word tempt right there in the King James, you look the word up in Hebrew and you find out it has got about four or five different possible definitions and usages. The word in the Hebrew, and this is going to be humorous for even me, is something like Nassau or something like that. That's as close as I'm going to get to it. But the possible translations, number one, the one that is used 20 times out of 36 times is prove. God never tempts you to fall, but he will test you to prove you. He will test you to encourage you. And you say, well, it doesn't feel like encouragement to do it to me. It will if you'll pray. I said it will if I'll pray. If I'll get down on my knees, you know what? It, the problem is, in my personal opinion, concerning me, not you, is that it's got to be a near-death experience before I'll ever bend these knees. I don't have arthritis, thank the Lord, but I've got no prayeritis. That's what attacks some of us sometimes. And that's why the temptations that are thrown out out there seem to overcome us. 
Well, it's not the temptation being so big. It's us refusing to go and get the power to overcome it. We don't want to bend those knees. We don't want to take time. We're too busy. It's not bad enough yet. We'll say, well, I hate this has happened. I wish I hadn't done that. Okay. Let no man say when he's tempted that God did it. God's not going to tempt you. But he will allow things. But he, here's the thing. He set, God sets us up for success. Did you know that? He sets us up winner, winner, chicken dinner. He sets us up to win, folks. He won't let a temptation come across our life's path except it be something that we, through him, <coughs> are great enough. I need to quit yelling. <coughs> we, through him, are strong enough to overcome. Don't think it, it overcomes us when we don't draw on the power that we can draw on. And that's the power of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Yeah, there's another scripture in there, something about a will with the temptation, provide a means of scale. I read that somewhere, right? Okay. He says, behold, here I am. Let's go to verse 2. Okay, here's what he says. Hey, he, said, he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. God knows the whole scoop, right? Amen. Anybody got kids out there? If you've got kids, raise those hands. Sure you do. You can put them down. God knows we love our kids. Now there's times we want to whoop them down and beat a little submission and a little obedience into them, but we, he knows we still love our kids, right? God feels the same way about us. He loves us when we're unlovable. Six of y'all, but that's the truth for the rest of us too. When we don't act lovable, God still loves it. That doesn't change at all. He may be disappointed in us. He may even want to spank us. I'm not sure if God wants to spank or not. I'll bet you dollars of donuts he ain't got no time out chair, but we're going to move on. <laughs> I'm just saying. Moving right along. <clears throat> thy son, which thine only son. If you only got one, it's precious, right? John 3.16 says God gave his only begotten son. Amen. Amen. For me and for you as a sacrifice for us. If there's only one, how much more precious, more valuable, inv invaluable, inestimable. I got that whole word out. I must be anointed this morning. Okay? You can't put a price on Jesus. He's the only begotten Son of God. And yet God gave him for me and you. That's what these things are about this morning tapped them and it didn't fall over. That's good too. Thank you. He did that. That's how much he loves us. And so we see here in this picture, this historical, hi historical yeah, that's the word, uh, picture that's written down here, we see what God is going to do in the future for us. And he called on Abraham to do this. And he says, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely amazing. Don't think that because Abraham did this, obeyed God to the letter, don't think that he didn't love his son and don't think that his son wasn't precious to him. Because he was. He still is. Okay? Which I shall tell thee of. Verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and split the wood. That's what clave means. He split the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place that God had told him of. He went to the appointed place. I'm going to tell you something. If you want a miracle of God, if you want a, a rendezvous with God, you're going to have to go to the place where he rendezvous. You knew I was going to get to padded chairs and not kneeling down at an altar, right? You knew I was coming to that, right? 
it amazes me how many people are suffering through something in life, but they will not come to the F R O N T and K N E E L. There's your two vocabulary words for today. There'll be tests on them next Friday. They won't do it. They'll sit in the pew and have a nervous breakdown. Uh, it's two amens, but I'm, I'm, I'm this is, sorry, y'all missed your chance. These amen me over here. Thank you, mm -hmm. brother. Praise God. Yeah, thank you, brother. <laughs> See, we sit in the pew and we just, we, we want to dial it up. We won't tell our friends, we won't tell everybody and his brother, but we won't come to the place to where God can put the medicine where the pain is. It's amazing, amazing, amazing to me that no matter how bad it gets, it's not bad enough. Our pride, Pastor, I'm not prideful. It, mm, I may have to meddle in your business this morning. You can't seem to get up and get forward and get down. I ain't talking about boogie and get down. I'm talking about get down. Your pride has got you. I don't care. The amazing thing, you can have pride being rich. You can have pride being poor. That's worse than poor. Pride will hold you back from the things God has for you. And you don't, it's not a one and done thing either. It's every time. Okay. Moving right along. And God told him to, the, to that, go to that place and offer his son. And he is diligent to go do it. That doesn't mean he enjoyed a single step of it. But he did it. He's in process. May I ask me and you this morning, are we in process of doing what God has told us to do? Just saying. Verse 4. Then on the third day, it is amazing, is it not, this little thing right here, that it took three days for him to get there? Did you get that three days? Abraham's son is dead three days in his mind. Because, see, he's not going there to see if God will change his mind. He's going there to do what God's already said. Too many people want to, they, they want to bargain with God and say, God, I really don't. Oh, God, God, you, did you really? Did you really mean, have you ever heard that before? You can track that back to original sin in the garden. Did God really say? Hmm. Moving right along. <clears throat> then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, I and the lad will go yonder and what? Worship. Isn't it amazing that to go and do what God said do is also kin to worshiping him. To be obedient to God is worship, which is your reasonable service. If you will track that thing back on your Bible study software and track out reasonable service, in the natural, it means it's not too much to ask, but it also is a possibility, a possible translation of worship. To be obedient. Check that out. In Rome. It's in Roman. I'm sure it's in Romans. Amen? I'm sure it's in there. Which is your reasonable service, which is your way of worshiping God. We don't look at as doing what God tells us to do as worshiping, but it is in His eyes. Hmm. Move it right along. And Abraham said unto the young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And what? Come again. Who's coming again? We. Thank you, brother. It's a plural thing. We are going to worship, and we will come again. That's not what it said. That's what it means. That's what it means. How in the world is God going to kill him and him still live? Show me money. Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. 
And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. You see a similarity in this, do you not? Verse 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, not Ishmael. That's implied meaning. Verse 19, here's the kicker. Accounting that God was able to raise him. Him is Isaac. Raise Isaac up, even from the dead, from whence also Abraham received him, in a manner of speaking. Because see, Abraham was just waiting to get to the place to... Right? He'd already settled that in his mind. It wasn't going to be pleasant. He was heartbroken over it, but he was going to obey God. But here's what he knew. That Isaac had to live even if he killed him because God had big plans for him. <laughs> Again, I say, <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? Back it up, Brother Dave, to where we were right there in, uh, in Genesis. There we go. And the lad and I will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Abraham said, I'm going to do what God said. I don't know how he's going to do it. But there's one thing about it. He is going to bring us both back out of it. What faith this guy who rode a donkey and wore sandals had. And here we are, sharp dressed man. And my faith wavers. And the guy in sandals, a rube, and riding a donkey, got it going on. Well, the clothes don't make faith, do they? Electronics won't bring you faith, will it? It is a knowledge of God and a trusting in God that he will do what he said he will do, and he hasn't changed his mind, oh, by the way. And you can trust it, no matter how rough it gets, when he says to go over to the other side, no matter how much water's in the boat, how high the waves are, no matter what the anemometer's saying, isn't that wind speed? It's wind speed, isn't it? Is it wind speed? Well, it's been a long time since I did an anemometer. I think it's wind speed. Some of you teachers bail me out. Is an anemometer, does it measure? Thank you, son. That's my firstborn right there. Praise God. Thank you. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Moving right along. We were in a moment, weren't we? No matter how bad everything gets and how high the waves and wind and, and, and all that is, if he told you to go to the other side, you're going to make it to the other side. Amen? Well, we may have to bail a boat. Well, bail. Bail. But he's going to give you the strength to Bail. And you're going to get there. Because he said, go to the other side. He's got big plans for Isaac. Yes? Mm-hmm. We're talking about God. We're not talking about Abraham. We're talking about God. Huh. That's what I'm talking about. He said, and the lad, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Brother Dave, take me on to... And that guy, he is on top of things back there, I'll tell you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. <laughs> He's hauling his, never mind. <laughs> He's hauling his own charcoal for the barbecue. He don't even know it. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm just saying. I know that wasn't nice. I mean, you ladies just rolled your eyes and I lost you, didn't I? and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them together, headed off to Mount Moriah. Isaac has no idea he's the guest of honor. Verse 7, and Isaac, he's sharp as a tack, isn't he? He picked right up, he's a, he's a man of detail. He don't know the detail, but he knows there's one missing. And, he's, and Isaac spake up and said, unto Abraham his father and said my father and he said here am I my son and he said behold the fire we got the fire checklist for you go camping we got the fire we got the wood 
But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Oh, my Lord. What a wonderful truth we're going to remember. I know you already know this, but what a wonderful truth we will see again in the Word today right before we partake of juice and bread representing the death of our Lord Jesus on our behalf. Verse 8, And Abraham said, Oh, what he said. Oh, what he said. I wonder if he knows how prophetic it is. Now, it's prophetic in the, that day God's going to do that. But that's the partial fulfillment. The big fulfillment is happening on down the way on calendar time. It's when Jesus, on what we call Good Friday, is, could only be considered good for us, the day Jesus died for us. Amen? The day he was sacrificed for our sins. Oh, my Lord. He said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, on together. We're going to celebrate, if you will. We're going to remember. Some get sad during the Lord's Supper. Some get glad. Me, I'm kind of wiggling both of them. Last night or this morning, sometime, I was kneeling by my bed and I was I was repenting and sorrowful for my sins and yet the next sentence after that, praising God for my perfection and righteousness. People that don't know what you and I know would think, has he indeed lost his mind? Because he's this way and he's that way. He is declaring mourning and sadness and joy and gladness. What in the world's the matter with this guy that's kneeling down praying in the wee hours of the morning and in one way he's repenting and just sad as he can be for how he is, and yet he's talking about how he is on the other side of things. Well, it's the difference is me without Jesus and me with Jesus. Without Jesus, I repent because I am undone. But with Jesus, I am perfect in every way and righteous in the eyes of God. Without Jesus, I am sad, without hope, and without a future. And with Jesus, oh, man, my future's so bright, I got to wear shades. I am looking upward and onward, and there's no height I can't attain because God has set me up for total success and bless. Amen? So anybody that was listening to my prayers... Well, I thought, boy, this old boy here needs to get, get on some meds because he can't figure out which side of the aisle he's on. I know which one I'm on, but I know which one I came from. I know which one I'm on, and I know what I will be if I don't get on that side and stay. Oh, it's all because of Jesus. It's all because of the Lamb that God provided for you and for me that we can smile. We don't have to be on medication for sadness and sorrow. Why? Because we're glad. We're happy. We're joyful. Why? Because of Jesus. We're perfect in every way only because we have Him. Well, good. I can live like I want to. No, you can't. It's all about the heart thing. God sees our hearts and knows if we believe that we have to have Jesus or we're just using him to do whatever we very well please, those people are more saved than a blue tick hound, I don't think. But luckily, I'm not the judge. I'm just the yelling, screaming preacher. Aren't we all glad of that? You better know it, amen, and, and yeah, to the power of ten. Amen and amen. Ain't it so? But see, it's not talking about being an immature Christian. I'm not talking about that. We're all immature at some level. I'm talking about those that use God's grace as their sin credit card and live like they, they st there's been no change of life. Now, we can't ever live good enough to be saved, but after we're saved, our life has to change, doesn't it? It doesn't have to change to my standard. 
It's all about the heart. That's why today every person in here, I'm not talking about the, the heart, the cardio, the, the muscle. I'm talking about how we feel about things. One time left church, I, and I told everybody, I know, that is amazing. I, can't, I couldn't believe it either. How could anybody get mad at me? I mean, dear, dear Lord, nothing but wonderful words, gracious words come from my mouth. Tall, good-looking guy, never, never on edge, ne never, never mad about anything, never gritting my teeth. Oh, my Lord. But someone got mad and left one time. It's the oddest thing you ever saw. I'm still perplexed by it. See? But I'm going to tell you something. Everybody has got somebody that's mad at you, and you've made them mad, and maybe you're mad at them. But I'm, and we need to be working on those to get them out of there, right? We got to work on them. They don't come out easy. Sometimes that thing has to fester. Then you can pick it on the rest of the way out of there. But let me tell you how you get it out. It's going to be at an altar of prayer. Whether it's up here or over there, it's going to be at an altar of prayer. That's where the surgery is done. Amen? But here's the most wonderful thing about God. He doesn't hold grudges. Isn't that amazing? He doesn't hold grudges. He doesn't say, well, don't, don't repent to me, you, you, you thousand-time repenter person. You've done repented a thousand times. Yeah, but I just need one more right now, God. Right? Amen. He doesn't hold grudges. Oh, he's not mad. He's not mad at you. He's not mad at me. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a miracle of miracles. He's not mad at me. He may be disappointed in me because I've been disappointed in me. Okay. He provides himself a lamb. He provides himself an offering. And he does, and the offering is of such, of such purity that we are saved from sins past, sins present, and from sins future. It's true. I know. You former Baptists ought to be jumped up and shouted. No, it's not Baptist. I'd get kicked out of a Baptist church. But anyway, moving right along, he, he said uh, he, God's going to provide himself a land. And boy, he did. Partial fulfillment of it here. Did Abraham know? He, he knew, but he didn't know all the way. Amen? Oh, Lord. Verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there. I'm trying to stay off of worship in that altar area, but I'm, gonna leave, I'm, I'm just going to leave that alone. I'm, I'm just going to leave it alone. Moving on. <clears throat> to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and <clears throat> laid the wood in order. <clears throat> laid the wood in order. Hmm. Laid the wood in order. You mean, you mean there's, there's an order? Anytime we worship God... When we have God in our lives, he brings order to it. I don't care if it's a pile of firewood. Moving right along. And he bound Isaac, his son. Woo! Oh, Lord. I bet Isaac's saying, Dad, what's really happening here? Dad. Dad. <laughs> I bet you, I don't know how big Isaac's eyes were. But I bet you they were real big right then. Because, see, Isaac's not in on this. Do you hear me? This is all God and Dad's business right here. Isaac's, Isaac's in the middle of it, but he ain't in on it. Right? You think about that. What if you were... This is not a fictitious story. I hope you understand. This is, this is real. This whole thing happened just like it's written. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, if he could have checked his pulse, I bet he's off the scale. Oh, Dad done bound me up. Wait a minute. That's, that's, that's not a, that's, uh, we've been to church before. It didn't look like that. It wasn't like that. Hmm. Huh. And laid him, he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Wow. How scared would you be? I don't know if Isaac had ever feared his daddy, but I think he was scared of him right now because he's bound 
Dad's got the knife. Don't forget, Dad's got the knife, right? Boy, you talk about somebody wanting to call child services right here, I guarantee you, I just want to get on that phone and say, I need some help right here. Dad has gone over the edge, okay? Look at this, verse 10. And Abraham, he is not praying and asking God, oh God, let's change this up. God told him, and he's fitting to do it. You understand, fitting? He's fitting to do it. Too many times we want to argue with God throughout the process. You know who that reminds me and God of? Balaam. You read that story of Balaam. That old boy, we got a little more money. Well, just a minute, let me pray about it one more time. I want to pray about it a little, one, one more time. Well, he, he said he'll give you whatever you had. Well, let me pray about that one more time. And finally God said, fine. I think he said it just like it. Fine. You go right on. And see, Balaam is not a guy that's blessed, okay? He, his, his, his whole actions and name are synonymous with a rebellious religious person. Moving right along. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Not to check it and see if it was sharp. Not to say, God, I'm going to give you another chance. God, would you like, God, would you, can, can, we, can we do this a different one? No. He took the knife to slay his son. That is why Abraham's name, regardless of what yours starts with, it's not due to alphabetical order. His name probably going to be on up there. Abraham. He took the knife to slay his son, and God knew his heart. Verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Do we read anywhere where Abraham has hearing impairment? No, he was so bent on doing what God told him to do. Do you hear me? God made sure to get him stopped because he's fitting to. Wowzer. Mm. He said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, here am I. Abraham still doesn't know what's going to happen. He just knows God called him, so he stopped. Right? He froze. Verse 12. Here's what God tells him. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Boy, there is a lot of preaching that I'm not going to do in this one verse. But surely you and the Holy Ghost are seeing some wonderful, wonderful things in this. Number one, God didn't want him. There would be no, no thing accomplished out of the death of Isaac for his death as a death. But what we do see is God told Abraham to test him, not tempt him. Amen? To prove him. Yes? To go and do. The Lord gives us little things to do, and he tells us if we're faithful in the little things, right? Now, this may not look little to you, I'm sure it wasn't little to Abraham, and I know Isaac remembered this till the day he was, till his, his, he said, man, let me, you, I don't know what you, let me tell you what dad did to me one time. <laughs> Every family reunion, and of course, brother Abraham, he's just smiling. <laughs> yeah, I did that. God told me to, though. I was following the Lord, yeah. Yeah, every time there was a family reunion, any holiday meal, I, you know Isaac said, hey, you, yeah, let me tell you what dad did. Okay. Isn't it amazing? So he says, neither do thou anything to him. 
For <coughs> now that I now I know that thou fearest God. Here's an amazing thing to me. Bless you. God has called on us to prove us and to increase our own faith that we will obey Him. This thing runs both ways. There's not a check valve in it. It runs both ways. We prove to God that we will obey Him, but we prove to ourselves that we will obey God. It increases our faith. If you'll be obedient in the little things, you be faithful over the little things, He'll move you up if He wants to. We don't do it to get to move up. We're happy in whatever state we're in, whatever we're called to do. But if God moves you up, make sure God moves you up and you don't have a five-step plan over the next three years. It's God. Amen? This is amazing to me. He stops him. He told him to do it, and then he didn't say psych, but he, it's, it's like he did because he stopped him. But the amazing, he says, I, now I know. Well, God's omniscient, yes? He knows. This whole thing is as much for Abraham as it is for anybody. God says, now I know. Well, it's just like in the Garden of Eden. God, omniscient God, all-knowing God, knows just what bush and what little bit of, bit of, bit of shrubbery that... What's those two guys, those two people in, in the garden? It, it was... Uh, it was Adam and Eve, wasn't it? Yeah, he knows just which bush they're behind. And yet God comes there after they've sinned, and he says, where are you? Adam, where are you? Well, God already knew where he was at. Why is, why is God doing That was more for Adam and Eve's sake than it was for God's. God already knew where they were at. God, right here, he's proving again. This is as much for, for, for Abraham's sake as it is for God's, even more, because God already knows that he would do this. But he said, now I know. See, we are physical people. We have bodies, yes? Please say yes. Don't creep me out. We have bodies. So regardless, I know you wish yours was taller, you wish it was shorter, you wish it was younger, you wish it was thinner. Yet I get all that. You want straight hair, you want curly I get it. Nobody's totally happy with what they got. Dear Lord, help us. But you know what? We got a body and God expects us in this body. Are we back to that situation in Romans where we're talking about a living sacrifice? Are we, have we come full circle on that thing already and hadn't even planned it? You mean God's got a plan in all this? Dear Lord, isn't that amazing? We're back to being a living sacrifice. Mm. Which is our, re oh Lord, we're back to the reasonable service which is our way to worship Him. Oh, man, there ain't enough time in the day for me to preach till I get tired of preaching. I've never gotten tired of preaching. I've been tired from preaching, but not tired of preaching. You know what I mean? No. Nope. Okay, moving right along. 13. Here's the punchline. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, what he had told his son has come to pass. I put that in there. You didn't notice that, did you? I'm slick like that. Okay. And behold, behind him, behind, behind him. Do you hear me? He couldn't see the provision of God till God stopped him. See? He, he, he didn't say, oh, never mind. Never mind, God. I, I won't do Isaac. I see a ram over here you provided. No, it wasn't that. God put it behind him. Total and complete obedience was what Abraham had in his mind, I'm going to slay my son because God said, do it. And somehow, God's going to clean this mess up, give life to him again, and we're going back down the hill and get on the donkey and go back home. Because God got big plans, and he's going to bring them through Isaac. Amen? Mm. Behind him. And behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. How long the ram been there? I don't know. When did he get there? I don't know. He just made, did God just create it? He could have. Was he there the whole time and God wouldn't let him say anything? I don't know. But they didn't see him, didn't know he was there. And all of a sudden, 
God had pro the prophecy. God had provided himself an offering. <laughs> and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son, and Isaac had a Jericho march. You know he did. It's not in there, but you know he did. He was one happy camper. <laughs> this thing worked out better than I ever, and there for time, I didn't know it was going to work out this good. 14, and Abraham called on the name of that, called the name of that place, Jehovah Jireh. Amen. In other words, it's going to come to pass to where you can see it. He's my provider. Amen. He's, it'll be where you can see it with your eyes. Oh, my Lord. My, my, my. What a story. What a situation. And the prophecy that Abraham spoke is what we're doing here with these stacks of trays of juice and cracker because it represents the body and the blood of the offering, the sacrifice that God provided for himself on our behalf. How wonderful God is. We come today to remember what Jesus did and, and is continuing to do for us. That's the, that's the neat thing. When you and I do something, we did it. But this saving, this cleansing, this giving of righteousness and perfection to us is a continuing. It's got I-N-G on the end of it. Oh, my Lord. Oh, what a God we serve. Amen.